Every day, we rely on technology. It's part of our lives. We're, we've gotten used to it. So probably everyone in this room has had the experience of wanting to drive somewhere. You enter the destination into your navigational system. A route is provided for you, and you head off on your way. Maybe you get traffic updates along the way, so technology is further in helping you to make decisions. But how can we take this even further? How can we step it up one more notch? So I would like for you to consider that while you're driving, the skies begin to darken. This looking ominous. And you get a report from your car computer, your car navigation system, that storms are developing. And based on your location and the speed in which you're driving, the navigation system tells you that you will likely encounter large damaging hail. Luckily, <clears throat> your navigational system in the computer has evaluated the situation based on incoming um, atmospheric and weather data and has provided an alternative route for you. You accept the route and then you take a slight detour. During your trip, you experience torrential rain, heavy winds, but no hail. You arrive at your destination slightly delayed, but safe. This is an example of what we're calling precision meteorology. So when you think precision meteorology, think about forecasts with spatial resolutions of one kilometer or less, so 0 0.6 miles or less. Temporal resolutions of less than an hour with lead times of 36 hours and maybe even more. Obviously, this type of technology could have a lot of impact on our lives and our society. It has been estimated that 30% of our economy is impacted by the weather. It's also been estimated that 3 to 6% of variability in the US GDP can be attributed to weather. So you would think that getting this right would be a good idea. Obviously, the weather impacts us all on a very personal level as well. Unfortunately, this level of forecasting, which I'm describing for you right now, does not currently exist. But it is achievable. So how can we tap in to technology to increase our forecast skill? How can we continue to leverage things we know about the atmosphere to make this a reality? That's what I'd like to explore with you um, today and also make you aware of the fact that this is being pursued right here within the University of Oklahoma. So to get a perspective on this, I would like to step back in time just a tad. In 1904, the Norwegian physicist by the name of Wilhelm Björknes published a paper which demonstrated that analytic forecasting could be possible by solving a system of nonlinear partial differential equations. Now, this was the birth of modern meteorology. Now, solving a system of nonlinear partial differential equations is not as easy as it sounds. And there were teams of people working on these calculations by hand, and it could take weeks to make a forecast, which was valid for only a 24-hour period, and the forecast wasn't that good. There was a British mathematician by the name of Lewis Fry Richardson who suggested that you could use 64,000 people working in parallel in order to make these calculations. Obviously, that wasn't achievable. So Richardson realized that we would have to wait. And he had this dream that in the, dis in the dim future that we'd be able to achieve forecast skill in a timely fashion. But he did went, go on to say that this was only a dream. So Richardson's dream has propelled us to try and challenge the um, nature and to figure out how we can best move us towards this idea of doing analytical weather forecasting. Now, in 1945, the ENIAC, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, was switched on. This was one of the very first computers state-of-the-art technology. And then in 1950, we had our very first 
nonlinear uh, weather forecast produced on this computer. It did take slightly over 24 hours in order to make a 24-hour forecast, but the seed had been planted. We knew that this was a possibility and something that we could move towards. Um, so another aspect in order to make our system of forecasting possible is we need atmospheric observations. This is a critical component. And we have scattered around the globe like 800 stations where twice daily balloons are, lift, are, carry, carry, um, are lifted into the atmosphere carrying packages that have sensors on them that can measure the atmosphere. We have constellations of satellites orbiting the Earth, staring down on the planet and trying to get better understanding of what the atmosphere is doing in the Earth's surface. We have networks of weather radar and other sensors. But we're talking about precision meteorology here today. For that, we really need to take our game a step further. We need very high resolution measurements. Now, it might surprise you to know that the region of the atmosphere, which is the most undersampled, the one that's really been difficult to address, is the one that's closest to where we live. This is called the atmospheric boundary layer. It's a, it has a depth of maybe one to two kilometers, so 0 0.6 to 1.2 miles. And it's extremely complex because you can have frictional drag on the wind fields as, they race as the winds race across the landscape. You have turbulence being generated by natural and man-made objects. You can have huge amounts of thermal energy being pumped into the atmosphere from the surface, which can generate convection. So this is the area that we really need to focus on if we're going to make precision meteorology um, a reality. We have a data gap right now that we desperately need to address. So now to put this in context, again, I want you to step back in time with me, but this time a bit further. Now I would like to go back to the time of the Norse gods. Anybody familiar with Norse mythology will be familiar with the name Odin. So Odin kept with him two ravens, Munin and Hugin, and he would send these ravens out to collect information about the affairs of the world. And they would come back, perched on his shoulder, and whisper what they had found into his ear. By a similar token, imagine if we can send robotic ravens out into the atmosphere to collect information about the state of the atmosphere. And then this information that can be transmitted back to us and whispered into the ears of computers this would give us data in that lower region of the atmosphere where we so desperately need. Of course, discussions of robotic ravens and Norse mythology all makes for great storytelling, but how can we tap in to this emerging technology of unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs or drones? This is an emerging technology. How can we best harness that for our needs? Well, there are networks of sensors scattered across the, the, the U.S. and around, across the, the world for measuring what's happening at the surface. These are funded by the national governments, but there are also state agencies like in Oklahoma where we have networks of 10-meter tall towers, 30-foot tall, 30-foot, um, where we can measure pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed, solar radiation, um, precipitation and things of that variety. There's a network of 120 of these scattered across the state. So this gives us a, um, a comp the ability to know what's happening near the surface. And it allows us to see complex structures in the atmospheric flow as depicted here. So by querying these 120 stations, we can see that there's a tongue of dry air coming into the state depicted by the yellow um, coloration on this map. So this kind of gradient can produce weather patterns and it can also maybe produce um, crop stress or even stress for animals or even for humans. So seeing that information is valuable, but we don't know how deep that dry layer may be, that dry tongue of air. So for that, we can imagine uh, um, extending our measurements up vertically into the atmosphere. 
So within, a state, within um, the University of Oklahoma, we are developing different types of vehicles that we can use for sampling the lower atmosphere. These drones, these UAVs, are helping us to collect information in that region of the atmosphere where the data are so desperately needed. So let's go back to the idea of having a network of sensors on the ground. Let's look at this, this drone here. This is what we call the, the copter sonde. So this was built by the Center for Autonomous Sensing and Sampling here at the University of Oklahoma. So it can produce measurements of pressure, temperature, humidity, wind speed and wind direction, basically the parameters that we need in order to improve forecast skill. So inside here is a brain, a little microcomputer, so it can actually make decisions while it's flying, collect data, communicate the data back in real time um, to the people on the ground, and then even get those off to other folks so we can make the best use of these uh, measurements. So this is a specifically designed instrument for the purpose of sampling the lower atmosphere. So the way you can imagine that working is if you have a network of towers, and then you put a box near the towers, and then on demand, these vehicles are sent up into the atmosphere, maybe several thousand feet, maybe one to two kilometers, and then come back. This is an example that we call operational observations. This happens on a very routine um, schedule. You know exactly when the measurements are going to be collected. And then after they're collected, you can transmit those data back to a central um, computer for processing. So if you're wondering when and where convection may occur, these types of data could be valuable for understanding that. If you're trying to um, get a better understanding of a winter weather um, situation, are you going to get precipitation, like in, in rain? Is it going to be freezing rain? Is it going to be snow Is sleet? Just knowing by one degree variability in the temperature field can make a big impact. So these types of data would be very valuable there. But another paradigm would be to explore how we can use um, UAVs to evaluate evolving weather patterns. Now let's consider the case of a supercell. And this is a numerical generated field looking at a storm. So this is a, a grid box. And now you see the storm, and we're coming into it from aloft. You'll see the anvil um, cloud, and then you'll start seeing the actual body of the storm. And you'll see the very complex nature of how these, these um, parcels of air, some with moisture, some without, evolve. And because you're doing a simulation, you can actually put in tracers to see how airflow is coming into the storm. Now, this could be moisture coming into the atmosphere. The moisture is the lifeblood of the storms. So this is a very important parameter to understand. So one way that we look at these systems is by using um, radar. By radar, we can transmit electromagnetic pulses. They scatter off the precipitation. The signals come back. And then by the strength of the signal, you can un understand how much precipitation is out there. So th here's where you get the signal from the radar. And this is a blind zone. The radio, radio waves just go right through there without giving any information. So here's an image of how a supercell might look. There's the radar. By interrogating where the precipitation particles are, you can start to see large-scale features like a hook echo, which is indicative of a mesocyclone. And you could have a tornado. But here is an inflow region into the storm. This is a rear flank downdraft region and a forward flank downdraft region. Now, all these areas are really important to understand, to know about the dynamics of the storm, but radars can't see there. So what if we were to release swarms of adaptive drones that can sample the atmosphere, and they can even make decisions while they're flying so they can know how to best position themselves to make the most effective sampling of this environment? That could help us understand if a storm is strengthening, if it's um, weakening, and what direction it might take. So this is definitely a very exciting time for meteorology. It's also coming at a time when the emerging technologies require this level of sampling. So we have package delivery. These 
to do effective package delivery, you're going to need to know what the weather conditions are near the surface. Farmers are using drones for doing precision agriculture. Again, to make those uh, measurements useful and effective, you need to know what the atmospheric conditions are like, as in precision meteorology. Air taxis and even ground-based vehicles are sampling the lower atmosphere, I mean, are requiring data from the lower atmosphere. But we can also harness these vehicles and let them be not only data users, but also data providers. If we were to put sensors on these um, vehicles, then they could also feed back data, maybe through 5G networks, so that we can better understand what's happening in that region of the atmosphere where we des so desperately need data. So this is like a network, a mesh of sensors to fill that data gap. So it's been over <clears throat> 100 years since Richardson had his dream. We've made a lot of progress since then, and that technology has been increasing exponential. So imagine what you'll see in the next five to 10 years. In your lifetimes, you could see improvements in weather technology which far exceed what we could even imagined even 10 years ago. But what I really want to emphasize to you that this is not something which is happening in the, in the far distant future. We're moving in that direction, but this is happening now. We are moving ourselves towards um, the ability to make precision meteorology. We're doing it partly here at the University of Oklahoma, but we're also relying on our partners across the country and around the world. So precision meteorology and the realizations of Richardson's dream is happening now. And I would say that it's coming to you on the wings of a drone. Thank you.